talk than work, yet here I am, day after day, haunted by one thought. I must write, I must write, I must write. This here's my study, the room in which I write my stories. I built it myself, actually. Cut the timber and fitted the logs. Made an awful mess of it. I do my writing here, at the side of the room, because the roof leaks directly over my desk. I move the desk, but it covers a hole I left in the floor. And the floor is built on the side of a hill, so in heavy rains, the room tends to slide downhill. <laughs> Many of the day I've stood in this cabin and passed my neighbors standing in the road. Still, I'm happy here, although I don't get enough visitors to suit me. People tend to shy away from writers. They assume we're always busy thinking. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Even my own dear sweet mother doesn't like to disturb me, so she always tiptoes up here and leaves food outside the door. I haven't had a hot meal in years. But I've done a good deal of writing here. Perhaps too much. I look out the window and think that life is passing me at a furious rate. So I ask myself, what is it that so compels me to write incessantly, day after day, page after page, story after story? And the answer is quite simple. I have no choice. I am a writer. <laughs> Sometimes I think I might be mad. Oh, I'm, I'm quite harmless, I assure you. But I do admit the fits of wandering. I'm engaged in conversations where I hear nothing and see only the silent movement of lips and answer a meaningless yes, yes, of course. And all the while I'm thinking, It'll make a great character for a story, this one. Still, while I'm writing, I enjoy it. And I enjoy reading the proofs, but as soon as it appears in print, I can see that it's all wrong, a mistake, and ought never to have been written. And I'm miserable. Then the public reads it. Yes, charming, clever. Charming, but a far cry from Tolstoy. Or, a fine thing, but Turgenev's fathers and sons was better. And so it will be to my dying day. Charming and clever, charming and clever, nothing more. And when I die, my friends will pass by my grave and say, here lies so-and-so, a good writer. But Turgenev was better. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but before you came in, I was thinking to myself, what if I gave it up one day? What would I do instead? Well, I've never admitted this to anyone, but to you here in the theater tonight, I would like to share with you what I would most like to do with my life. Ever since I was a small child, I always, I always, just a moment, an idea just occurred to me. Yes, yes, the subject for a short story. It was my mention in theater that sparked it. What were we discussing a moment ago? <laughs> no matter, my thoughts are consumed with this new story. Uh, see how this appeals to you. It starts in a theater. It starts on the opening night of a new season. It starts with the arrival of all those dear and devoted patrons of the arts who wave and greet each other in the grand salon, commenting how this one looks or how that one is dressed, scarcely knowing what play they are about to see that night. All with the exception of one man, Ivan Ilyich Cherdyakov. If Ivan Ilyich Cherdyakov, a civil servant, a clerk in the Ministry of Public Parks, had any passion in life at all, it was the theater. He certainly had hopes and ambitions for higher office, and had dedicated his life to hard work, perseverance, and patience. Still, he would not deny himself his one great pleasure, so he purchased two tickets to the very best section of the theater for the opening night performance of Rostov's The Bearded Countess. As fortune would have it, into the theater that night came his respected superior, General Mikhail Brasilhoff, the Minister of Public Parks himself. Good, good evening, General. What? Oh, yes, good evening. Permit me, sir. I am Chernikov. I'm an Ilyich. This is a great honor for me, sir. Yes? Like yourself, dear general, I too serve the Ministry of Public Parks. That is to say, I serve you, who is indeed himself the Minister of Public Parks. I'm the Assistant Chief Clerk in the Department of Trees and Bushes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, keep up the good work. Lovely trees and bushes this year. Very nice. Oh, my, my brother would very much like to say hello, General. This is he, my brother, Simon Cherdikov. How do you do, General? My pleasure. My pleasure, General. Madam Brasilhov, my brother, Simon. <coughs> How do you do? <laughs> do. I just had the pleasure of meeting your husband. And this is my brother. And I am my brother's brother. How do you do, Madam Brasilhov? Sorry, terribly sorry. I hope you enjoy the show, sir. I will, if I can watch it. Feeling quite pleased with himself for having made the most of this golden opportunity, 
Ivan Ilyich Cherdikov sat back to enjoy the bearded countess. He was no longer strangers with the Minister of Public Parks. They had become, if one wanted to be generous about the matter, familiar with each other. And then, quite suddenly, without any warning, like a bolt from a gray thundering sky, Ivan Ilyich Cherdikov reared his head back and a chew! Oh my goodness, Your Excellency, I am so sorry. I am so terribly sorry. Oh, it's quite all right. It is not all right. It was unpardonable. It was monstrous of me, sir. Well, you make too much of the matter. Let it rest. Permit me to wipe your neck, General. It looks like you do. Permit me. It's all right. But I splattered you. Your complete and total head is splattered. It was an accident, I assure you, but it's disgusting. <laughs> sorry. Terribly sorry. It's not a... a if that's what you're wondering, probably just a particle of dust in the nostrils. <laughs> they try as he might. Cherdikov could not put the incident out of his mind. The sneeze, no more than an innocent anatomical accident, grew out of all proportions in his mind until it resembled the angry roar of a cannon aimed squarely at the enemy camp. He replayed the incident back in his mind, slowing the procedure down so he could witness again in horror the infamous deed. <laughs> charming, charming. Did you think it was charming, my dear? Yes, I found it utterly charming. I was completely charmed by it. Who's that tapping? Someone is tapping me. Who is the tapper? I'm the tapper, Sir Cherdikov. I, I was just concerned about your going into the night air with the damp head. Stand oh. back, dear. It's the sneezer. No, no, it's quite all right. I'm all sneezed out now, but I was just concerned about it. Well, don't worry about it. It was a trifle, a mere faux pas. Put it out of your mind. How did you enjoy the show? Oh. Did you find it amusing? Amusing? Oh, yes. <laughs> I haven't laughed that much in a year. <laughs> Indeed, and what was your favorite part? The sneeze. When I sneezed on you, it was unforgivable, sir. Oh, that. Please, stop apologizing for it. It's fine. Come to my dear. It looks like rain. I wouldn't want to get my head wet again. <laughs> you shouldn't let people sneeze on you, dear. They're not to be sneezed at. I'm ruined! Ruined? They'll have me fired from trees and bushes. I'll be set down to branches and twigs. <laughs> it's not a big deal. The general's probably forgotten about it already. Do you really think so? No, I'm sure. <laughs> and so they walked home in despair. Perhaps we should get him a nice gift. Maybe some Turkish towels? Cherdikov's once promising career had literally been blown away. Why did I go to the theater at all? Why did I sit in the balcony with the people of our own class? They love sneezing on each other. <laughs> go to bed. No, no, I should call the general in the morning. I'll explain manners in such a charming, honest, and self-facing way that they'll have no choice but to forgive me. Maybe it's best not to remind him. No, if I ever expect to be a gentleman, I must behave like one. And so morning came. It just so happened that this was the day the general listened to petitions. And since there were 50 or 60 petitions ahead of Cherdikov, he waited for morning till late, late afternoon. Next. Oh, I'm not next, Excellency. I'm last. Very well, then. Last? Oh, that's me, sir. Well, what is your petition? I do not have a petition, sir. I'm not a petitioner. Then you waste my time. Do you not? Recognize me? We met last night under rather explosive circumstances. I'm the splatterer. The what? The splatterer. The sneezing splatterer. I sneezed on you, sir. Indeed. And what is it you want now? A gesundheit? No, Excellency. Your forgiveness. I only wanted to point out that there were no political or antisocial motivations behind my sneeze. It was a non-violent, non-partisan act of God. I curse the day the protuberance formed itself upon my face. It is a hateful nose, sir, and I am not responsible for its indiscretions. Punish that which committed the crime, but absolve the innocent body behind it. Exile my nose, your kinship, but forgive me, forgive me. My dear young man, I am not angry with you or your nose. I am much too busy to have time for your nasal problem. <laughs> I suggest that you go home and take a hot bath or a cold one. Take something, but do not bother me with this silly business again. Jibber, jibber. That's all I hear all day. Jibber, 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 jibber. God bless you, sir. God bless you and your wife and your home. May your days be sweet, and may your nights be greater than your days. The 
feeling of relief that came over Charity Cup was enormous. May the birds sing at your window, and may the coffee in your cup be strong and hot. The weight of the burden lifted was inestimable. I worship the chair that you sit on, and the uniform you wear that sits on this chair that I worship. He walked home singing and whistling like a lark. Life was truly a joy, a marvel, a heavenly paradise. Oh God, I am happy. And yet. And yet. When he arrived home, he began to think. Have I been the butt of a cruel and thoughtless skill? Had the minister toyed with him? If he had no intention of punishing me, why did he torment me so unmercifully? If the sneeze really meant so little to the minister, why did he deliberately cause Cherdikov to writhe in his bed? To twist in agony the entire night! Cherdikov was furious! I'm furious! He foamed and fumed and paced the night through, and in the morning he called out, Simon! Or the Lord! <laughs> I've been humiliated. You? Who would humiliate you? I'll tell you who. General Brakhov, the Minister of Public Parks. What did he do? The swine! He humiliated me in such a subtle fashion it was almost indiscernible. The man's cunning was equal only to his cruelty. He practically forced me to come into his office and grovel and beg on my knees. I was reduced to a gibbering idiot. You were that reduced? I must go back and tell him what I think of him. The lower classes must speak up. The world must be made free so that men of all nations and creeds, regardless of color or religion, will be free to sneeze on their superiors. It is he who will be humiliated by I. And so the next morning, Cherdukov came to humiliate he. Last! <laughs> well? Well? Do you not recognize me? Take a look at my face. Yes, you are quite correct. It is I, once again. It is you, once again, who? Cherdikov, Excellency, <laughs> I have returned, having taken neither a hot bath nor a cold one. Who let this filthy man in? What is it? What is it? What is it? You sit there behind your desk and ask, what is it? You sit there as general and minister of public parks, a member of high standing society, and ask me, a lowly civil servant, what is it? You sit there with the full knowledge that there is no equality in this life, that there are those who serve and those that are served, those that obey and those that are obeyed, those that bow and those that are bowed to, that in this life certain events take place that cause some of us to be humiliated and others to be the cause of this humiliation, and you still ask, what is it? What is it? Don't just stand there gibbering like an idiot. What is it that you want? I'll tell you what I want. I only wanted to apologize for sneezing on you again. I just wanted to be sure you knew that it was an accident. An accident that I should Out! Out! I tell you, I never want to see your face again. If you ever cross the, my line of sight again, I will have you exiled forever. You... What is your name? Jacob! Oh! You men, you germ spreader, you insect, you are lower than an insect, you are the second cousin to a cockroach, the nephew of a ringworm. You, you, my friend, are nothing. Do you hear me? Nothing! At that moment, something broke loose inside of Cherdikov. Something so deep and vital, so organic, that the damage that was done seemed irreparable. The matter was over for once, for all. Forever. What happened next was quite simple. Ivan Ilyas Cherdikov arrived home, removed his coat, lay down on the sofa, and died. <laughs> Wait, there's an alternate ending. Ivan Ilyas Cherdikov arrived home, uh, removed his coat, lay down on the sofa, and inherited five million rubles. Woohoo! <laughs> there's not much point to it, but it is uplifting. I assure you, it is not my intention to paint life any harsher than it is. But some of us are indeed trapped. Witness the predicament of a young governess who cares for and educates the children.